So for the 15th day of class, we are still looking at Islam, but Islam in South Asia and Southeast Asia, whereas yesterday's class was the Middle East. Now, bearing in mind, when Islam showed up to this part of the world, there were two world religions already there, Hinduism and Buddhism, and we're going to look at that story and how that worked out. So again, those three major religions affect this part of the world. And now Islam does spread through conquerors and traders and people getting on boats and the Indian Ocean trade route and a sultanate called the Delhi Sultanate that establishes Islam in the region. Now Hinduism, very old religion, the oldest of the world religions originated in India, but it didn't spread real well because of its caste system remain primarily an Indian religion, which it still does today, whereas Buddhism also originates in India, but it rejected the caste system, so it had more um, of an influence on the region than Hinduism did, okay? So anyway, when I mean South Asia, I'm talking about this part of the world here, okay? And we have these religious practices taking place, Islam, Hinduism, the Bhakti movement, Buddhism, and we see these empires emerging, and they had their respective religions that went along with them. The Vijayanagara, tough word to say, and the Rajput and the Sinhala. Now, if I look at the Delhi Sultanate, now the Delhi Sultanate, I'm going to go to here because we're only being tested from 1200 on. We see the Delhi Sultanate establishing an Islamic state in this part of northwest and northern India. Now, to this day, we have Bangladesh here and Pakistan here. So it shows the staying power of how strong Islam was and is in the region. Okay, it's 1206 to now. That's a long time for those who are struggling with history. Now, if you look at Islam in India, the Islamic people learn from India. It's cultural diffusion. Again, India, very, very old culture, 3,500 years of civilization. And when the Islamic people intermix with them, they learn from them. People learn from one another. And again, what intelligent people do is they steal the good practices that people are doing. Always has been the case, always will be the case. Okay. Now, if you look at Hinduism and Islam, so the first time Muslims show up and mix with Hindu people, they didn't fit well into the caste system. Hindus had a very regimented, clear caste system. Now, the people at the top did not consider Muslims their equal, but the people at the very bottom of the caste really liked how Islam rejected that. So it was an easy conversion for somebody to say, well, in Islam, you're on the same page as me, whereas in Hinduism, you're beneath me. Okay. So they did not blend. They could did not, they're not compatible. Okay. To this day, there's Pakistan and India for this reason. So if you look at Hinduism, it's open, it's tolerant, but it's polytheistic. Okay. Whereas Islam is monotheistic, you're never going to get over that hump to have a common ground. Hinduism has a rigid caste system. Islam is more egalitarian. Therefore, these are two fundamental differences, which is going to be hard to reconcile. And they don't get reconciled historically or presently. Now, this Bhakti movement, which was uh, mentioned in your book, now, bhakti means devotion or devotional love. Now, it emerges in South India a very long time ago, 7th century. Now, it's a reform of Hinduism that promoted an alternate path to salvation through devotion, not ritual. Now, it became very popular because it empowered those at the bottom of the caste system, and it emphasized the individual's direct connection to the gods. Now, the uh, Bhagavad Gita is one of the central bhakti text and it's a defining moment in hinduism today real pivotal moment for this very very old religion hinduism okay now the vijayanagara empire this very well may show up on your test as you can see from the time so these are the southern provinces and they unite okay now very wealthy bear in mind you know this part of the world has 25 percent of the world's gems okay so they were wealthy they were in the indian ocean trade route trading with china hinduism was promoted this notion of bhakti was very prevalent right there and so what we see here is we see it being significant in world history as this empire that tr transcended regionalism by promoting this form of hinduism and unifying people okay now the rajput they claim descendants from three Hindu gods. Um, they became an elite group of Indians who were mostly in the warrior 
caste. Now, they never unite into one large kingdom because they're very loyal to their clan. But we have these Rajput kingdoms, and this is kind of the uh, military side of things. And they prevented total Muslim conquest. So as Islam is spreading, it hit that wall where it didn't spread any further. Okay, And India, even when Alexander the Great showed up a long, long time ago, they were able to stop them. So India's always had a history of you know, military might, and the Rajput, in a sense, were the people that allowed India to remain Hindu, or portions of India at the time, what we consider modern India, okay? Now, the Sinhala dynasties, these are talking about this teardrop-shaped island southeast of India, Sri Lanka. So, the Sinhala monarchies refer to these kings of Sri Lanka. Now, it was a monarchy with absolute power, and Buddhism gets introduced. Now, Buddhism became the prominent religious practice on the island, okay? So, what's happened here are these three religions on the Indian subcontinent are taking their geographic areas, and they've remained pretty well. Now, if you're absent, which is probably the only reason you're watching this, at this point in class, we said, what are some major empires in South Asia and some facts, just to review what we've done, okay? Now, if I look at Southeast Asia, which is this part of the world, again, here's Islam, Hinduism, Bhakti movement, Buddhism, and we see more empires and kingdoms, the Khmer Empire, the uh, Srivijaya Empire, the Majapahit Empire, and the Sukhothai Kingdom, okay? I probably mispronounced at least one of those, okay? But anyway, when you look at Islam in Southeast Asia, you can see it spreading, okay? And again, with this Indian Ocean trade route, they're interacting with these people, and the coastal cities, the ones doing the most business, were the most receptive to Islam. And you know, it to this day, it's a mixed bag in Southeast Asia. For instance, Indonesia is Islamic and some places are not. But if you look at Buddhism versus Islam compared to Hinduism versus Islam, Buddhism is very open, tolerant of other religions. There's multiple forms of Buddha, um, whereas Islam is monotheistic. So again, you have that division there. However, in Buddhism, they have the belief that all are equal and renounce the caste, and same with Islam. So on a very simple level, with I mean, I take Hinduism versus Islam, it's 0 for 2. And I take Buddhism versus Islam, it's 1 for 2. So it was a little bit, you know, a little less contentious than Hinduism versus Islam. Now, Buddhist mon monasticism, you've heard of a monastery, is um, a form of Buddhism that gains legs during this time. Now, it's important to world history because it um, helped Buddhism spread from India to Southeast and East Asia. And these Buddhist monks are teachers. They live very simple, very uh, ritualistic, regimented lives. And they show the people how to lead a Buddhist life. So similar to the uh, ulama to Islam, these monks become instrumental to Buddhism in its spread, okay? Now, the Srivijaya Empire, we can see, becomes modern-day Indonesia. So, with the spread of this, now bear in mind, lots of trading here, lots of ports. This allowed um, a lot of mixing that was going on. So, what we see here um, would be... Um, heavily Buddhist. Popular form was this, uh, so this uh, Vajrayana Buddhism, which is hard to say, is a mystical form of Buddhism that involves the cultivation of magical or supernatural powers. And this is popular because Buddhist monks mix Buddhist practice with indigenous reliance on magic, this syncretism, this blending of religion. So anyway, this we see here, we see how these islands are, you know, doing their thing. And the Khmer, Empire, you may have heard of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Um, again, this is another, well, you know, the main point, let me focus on one main point here, and uh, Champa rice patties. Now, Champa rice patties are actually uh, mentioned in your AP review guide come springtime. And because what happens is to make Champa rice requires huge amounts of coordination, science, and government to coordinate it. So once we see groups of people adopting uh, rice patties, what it does, it facilitates more complexity into their people. But again, this is another example of Buddhism. And to this day, 
um, still Buddhist. Okay, the Sukhothai kingdom, we're talking Thailand, and, um, you know, it became Hinduism, and there's a mix of Buddhism. So you can see throughout this region, the, the religions, you know, people are mixing, and some adopt one, some adopt another. Uh, the Majapahit Empire, okay, you can see this is a very, very big geographic region, and we see, again, trading and Hinduism, and there's some Islam mixed in there. So what I'm trying to get at is there's a real mix here, and I'll get into this when we're going into the um, Indian trade routes in more detail. I'm getting a little long on time here. And again, we, we'll get into the Indian Ocean trade route, but these are hugely important to the waters, what the, you know, to the waterways where the Silk Road is to land, and people are mixing, cultures are mixing, religions are mixing, ideas are mixing, and I'm not going to do justice in this short video to show that, but that's kind of the vibe when I'm having you get at. I'm going to go into more detail about these um, at another time, okay? And people are moving, diaspora, people are moving. Okay, so we ended class with more of a role play. So I wanted you to kind of walk in these people's shoes and imagine you're a trader in India. How do you feel about Islam? Are you interested in it? See what you can come up with. Imagine you're an aristocrat in India. Do you like Islam? Are you interested in it? Explain. And imagine you're a trader in Southeast Asia. Do you like Islam? Are you interested in it? So this is the application of what I hope you learn through class and through books and that kind of thing. So if you are absent, if you want to take a stab at these, I would appreciate it. And um, I appreciate you watching and stay well.